Hi again. Uh, welcome to chapter six, forecasting demand. Uh, initially, in the first five chapters, we learned on the importance of revenue management for hospitality. Also, what uh, we need to be focused on, like a strategic pricing, strategic approach, and also revenue management principles. Starting from this chapter, we will more focus on revenue management practices and uh, application. Uh, specifically in this chapter, we will try to explain why collecting and analyzing data about customer demand for lodging products and services are essential for forecasting sales. Uh, we will also uh, look at the presentation of the tools that uh, revenue managers use to track historical, current, and future demand for their room's inventory. And also, uh, we will talk about the examination of how demand uh, forecasts affect decision on hotel rooms uh, and services pricing. Before I start, uh, I want to remind you one more time. The only way to maximize long-term revenue generation is to develop loyal customers who prefer to buy from you. Even there is a, a relatively lower cost alternatives available for them. Before I start the customer demand, I want you to be I want you to be sure to understand that forecasting itself is very important and hard to do topic. I mean, you can hear forecasting in everywhere, right? In economics, for example, lately uh, Federal Reserve trying to uh, decide if the interest rates needs to be increased uh, or just stop here. And it affects every aspect of our economy. And they are trying to figure out that using the forecastings, but uh, it's not that easy. But specifically in our field, uh, more specifically in the customer demand, we need to focus in uh, several areas. But what, what do we mean by customer demand? First, the, the customer demand means the number of potential buyers with desire willingness and ability to purchase the product sold by your business or uh, assuming specific price of course uh, we try to estimate future values of factors relevant to decision now why we need the forecasting because we need to use to improve our decisions why we need to improve our decisions for several reasons first uh, efficiently schedule employees. I mean, think about it. If your hotel has a hundred percent occupancy, you're gonna need how many people you're going to need versus if there is only twenty percent occupancy, right? Uh, purchasing supplies. Uh, you are a, a restaurant. Uh, I mean, if the, the your restaurant is uh, is gonna be hundred percent capacity, and uh, if you buy less products, then you're gonna be very upset customers. But if you have a very low uh, occupancy, there is a less people coming to your restaurants, you're going to uh, have a bunch of spoiled uh, uh, products, right? For example, so purchasing supplies is also important. Managing cash flow. And uh, when we talk about the managing cash flow, we are talking about the estimating future profitability and how you're going to, uh, uh, like, you know, you have a payment uh, or uh, 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 you're going to do capital improvement and expenditure. So you need to know the, the cash flow aspect of your business. And also, most specific to our revenue management side, establishing the future prices for products and services. Because if you know exact demand, which is almost impossible, but is, you will be try to be as close as possible, it could be very helpful to your uh, revenue management aspect of your business. Now, there are many different uh, approaches to uh, uh, de demand forecasting, but overall there are four components of effective forecasting. The first thing is, I want you to understand one thing is, there are many different forecasting methods, both in the effectiveness and complexity. It could be as simple as, I'm going to give some example on the end, but it could be as simple as, for example, what is the today's uh, uh, demand? Is it similar to last week's Tuesday's demand? Like, this is a naive method. Like, what happened in the past is going to be exactly similar to happen. Or it could be as complex as, like, uh, 
machine learning or, or artificial intelligence approach, for example. So desired methods depends on application and in, in your uh, uh, team's capacity. But there are overall four components of ex effective forecasting. The first thing is, of course, historical data. As the name implies, that events already happened in the past. You always have those data. And next one is the current data. Events happening right now or in very near term. And the next one is the future data. As the name implies, events that will going to happen in the future. I'll give you all of them an example in a, a few minutes. And last one is the also the most important one in a sense, because the other ones are uh, collected and analyzed. It could be even done using the certain computer algorithms. But last one, insight, is requires the uh, uh, human touch in a sense, what the revenue managers does. Insight means understanding how the things works, cause and effect. It usually comes from experience and analytical skills. Let's start with the uh, uh, historical data, also, also known as actual data or result data. Now, why historical data important? Because we assume that what happens in the past is a good indicator what might happen in the future. Now, what kind of data is available? Let's go over that first. Like, for example, number of reservations booked, denied. Right? How many reservations booked? How many reservations we declined? Number of daily cancellations. Think about it. If we know exactly, uh, know, I mean, forecasting-wise, we know what happened in the past, but we, let's say we always have 5% cancellations in our reservation, always. So then we can maybe use that for overbooking. Just to give you an example, because we know that 5% of the people is going to cancel anyway, right? Number of check-ins or number of check-outs. Their times as well, when, they, when, when it's happening, how many check-ins can, you can schedule, the, for example, front desk employees. Uh, no-shows, walk-ins, similar to cancellations or no-shows, we can use that no-shows for uh, our, uh, uh, for example, overbooking. Walk-ins, how many people... Uh, getting uh, uh, walking in our property directly without the reservations, ADR achieved right. How much is the ADR which create average daily rate, occupancy of property, the occupancy of both property, and also uh, uh, what kind of room types more occupied, average length of stay, how many days people are staying, and this is uh, left side is more of a property wise, and right side as a revenue manager or general manager you should know. The overall uh, uh, area related, or I mean, it could be from all the way from national level, state level, district level, or, or your area. Uh, first one is the tourism demand. If you know exactly how many tourists are going to come to your, uh, let's say, in Florida or like, like most specifically in Orlando, it could help you to estimate uh, uh, your future forecasting in a, in a sense better way. Macroeconomic indicators such as GDP. Why that is important? You know that if the uh, majority of the macroeconomic indicators shows the health of economy, and if you know that economy is getting better, you know that more people want to go to vacation, for example. Current currency exchange ratios, like let's say majority of the people coming from, let's say, Europe. So if you know the euro versus uh, 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 dollar exchange rate, and you, if you can estimate some of the future forecasting, it might help you for several reasons. For the cash flow first, and the second, uh, if, if there is, a, like for example, if the uh, ratio is going to negative towards the uh, European people, then it's going to be more expensive to come, for example, United States, because they are making the same money, but now this dollar is more expensive, just to give you an example. Political environment is important, because this is, of course, several aspects of it, but one example is going to be uh, in, in the United States, uh, Democrats versus Republicans, and how do they approach the taxation of businesses, right? That could be important. Climate elements, sports, like market trends, taste. Let, let's say more people going to a vegetarian option right now, and then you might maybe think about what kind of future you want for your restaurant. Sport event, like if, if you're a, a, a hotel, and you know that even in the restaurant, there is a, some kind of event going on in your area, like similar to sports, 
then you might want to adjust your uh, forecasting. These are a few of the historical examples. Um, this is an, uh, there are many different ways to, of course, uh, calculate, but this, is, this example is given in the book is, it's called trailing eight week average, which means you look at the last eight weeks of your uh, property, what happened. Now, uh, let's say you have a, a 200 room hotels and you receive proposal for 100 rooms at $109 for Monday. This is the example from the book. Do you sell, right? Uh, I will uh, make a, I, I will solve one of the, the similar uh, question in the chapter six, apply what you know, if you wanna, uh, if you like to watch. Now, why we use historical data, by the way, is if, if there's a lack of information, we don't know enough to predict the forecast, usually we assume that past could predict future. That's the one of the reasons we use the historical data, so we can some estimate and forecasting. And what about additional factors to incorporate? There is uh, many examples in the book, like additional revenue, expense, impact in, in future pricing, etc. But whenever you make a decision, you need to look uh, uh, in your future, I'm, I'm sorry, the historical uh, uh, data. In this case, for example, in last eight Mondays, occupancy was 88%. Average daily rate was $158 and REFPAR was $139. So you assume that next Monday is going to be also is about the similar at least, unless there is some special event going on and, and seasonality, etc. You might want to in incorporate. But why are we talking about trading or rolling averages? Let, let me uh, talk about this a little bit. Trading period is a data collection where you discard the oldest piece of data in data set when the newest data are added. Uh, this way, information is updated while keeping the set size constant. We usually use trading periods data in calculating a rolling average. Like, for example, in this example, last eight Mondays. Let's say one more week passed, you discard the last one week, right? In, like here... Uh, Actually, they, 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 in, the, in this example, they focus on the seven-day rolling average. But and if you look at it, they look at the last seven days. And the next day, they eliminate the uh, oldest one and add the new one. So they, you can calculate this in the uh, rolling averages. So overall rolling average is an average calculated by using historical data generated during a changing time period. In this like first example, we were looking at the eight Mondays, eight Tuesdays. But in this example, they just look at the last seven days. It, it depends in, in how you're going to use it. Uh, so everything it, it has its uses. In uh, a hotel industry, for example, uh, you might want to look at the like eight Mondays, eight Tuesdays, etc. Because each day has a kind of different uh, demand patterns. But in this case, for example, whatever they are using, it's look at still large, so it's a hotel property, but they are looking at the last uh, seven days, uh, whatever for their reasoning is. So regardless of the types of average they utilize, revenue manager must track their historical data because it's from sales histories that they will be better able to predict current and future operating data. So that is why it is important to, to know what happened in the past and always control them. So that's the historical. Now, <clears throat> for the current data, revenue manager usually monitors several things. First one is the occupancy and availability report. Like for example, uh, the number of rooms available to sell, right? You have to know that. The number of room reserved, the number of rooms held or blocked, usually is a group block. Uh, estimated ADR resulting from current reserved or blocked rooms because now you know how many people reserved and you know how many people coming from group or transitional or uh, they you already give them basically some price so you can estimate the ADR. A minimum length of stay, uh, like for example, they need to stay uh, uh, three minimum three uh, night minimum. For example, minimum length of stay is usually used uh, uh, in certain events like uh, revenue management. This is a kind of revenue management strategy that instruct the reservationist, the front desk, to decline any room reservation request that does not equal or exceed the predetermined minimum number of nights allowed, which means 
you are telling the people if, even if there is an event like for one night uh, they have to stay two or three nights it depends on the uh, uh, whatever your reasoning is so you give them restriction in the, how many nights they have the minimum they have to stay and there is also group rooms pace reporting and, and pickup reports and non-rooms revenue pace reporting uh, this is one of the example of the uh, from the book uh, uh, occupancy detailed data I just want to show you this. Uh, you might be, uh, uh, you have to be familiar if, if you are in the hotel industry with similar report. Uh, in in this example, number one is the run date, right? Run date indicates when the report was prepared. Two is the date column. Column one is the identifies the numerical day of the month. Okay. Number two is the basically day of the week. Number uh, uh, four is the rooms available column is the total number of uh, sellable rooms in the hotel like in this example for uh, 1400 but uh, if you look at like uh, uh, June 10th is dropped to 1380 so you might guess uh, probably there is uh, something wrong with those rooms or whatever whatever the reason but they are uh, out of order but it has the, it, this columns gives all the rooms available for sale is also used for the uh, uh, refar as well so in the refar calculations in the first uh, what is it one two three four five six in six uh, 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 rooms available for 1400 you have to calculate refar using 1400 but next one two three days you need to use 1380 I guess they fixed the rooms or whatever whatever's happened they increased to 1400 again uh, next one is the reserved column represent the number of rooms for which there is a currently as of the run date a confirmed reservation is somebody will reserve that room uh, number six the blocked column represent the number of rooms being held by property for one or more groups whose members have not yet individually reserved the rooms but they request it and you block those rooms uh, number seven is the total health uh, basically is the uh, uh, adding the uh, reserved and blocked and number eight the current occupancy indicates the percentage of uh, hotels rooms that are currently reserved and or blocked from uh, sale uh, it is the occupancy percentage the hotel would experience of all current reserved rooms and Currently blocked group rooms were in fact sold on that date. This uh, percentage can uh, exceed 100% uh, because uh, sometimes groups block the rooms or reserve block the rooms. Do you remember we were talking about the uh, uh, historical data, no shows and cancellations? So because of that, uh, sometimes uh, you reserve or overbook more. But uh, like for example, in this case is... Uh, June 5th, for example, 107%. Um, and number nine is the total. That, that's basically the sums of each category during the how many days? It's a 14 day period covered in the report. This is just one of the examples of the, the reports. Uh, oh, we were, I, I was going to talk a little bit about the Broom Room's uh, pace reporting. Uh, pace report is the summary report uh, describing the amount of future demand for a lodging properties uh, group rooms and rates at which uh, that group business has been captured also uh, referred to as group rooms booking pace report I mean for example if 200 group rooms are reserved and only 100 are ultimately occupied the pickup rate is 50% right they order reserved for 200 but only 100 occupied, so we got the 50% pickup rate. Over time, uh, uh, you will also learn, uh, actually, I'm making calculations as well. Uh, over time, you will learn some groups are uh, make a. I don't want to get into too much detail, but there are different ways the group contracts work. Like, you might say, for example, you're going to uh, uh, book 200 rooms. But with the minimum pay, minimum pay of like hundred, so basically they have to pay minimum hundred. It doesn't matter how many people are are uh, occupied because not uh, people uh, uh, similar to forecasting groups also make some kind of forecasting how many people are gonna show up, but it might not work. 
but to protect your business you might say you know what you have to pay at least minimum 100 rooms no matter how many people show up but in this case uh, we assume that 200 uh, originally held and 100 occupied so you got the 50 percent pickup you need to know also different groups because if you know that only 50 percent pickup which means 100 room is not going to be occupied then you can maybe do all working or, or uh, uh, different ways to sell those rooms and what is the last time non rooms would have any pace reporting uh, this is that pace report should be prepared for any identifiable segment of business that generates significant revenue including income from different parts like restaurants bars conferences bank banquets spas and and, and variety of uh, uh, other operating departments these are the some of the example of uh, current data now future data is uh, of course the important part right because we need to try to understand the, we usually uh, separate in the two things first you need to understand the factors affecting the future demand one is called demand generator uh, which means an entity or event that produces a significant increase in business like you, if you know some kind of conference going on in your area big conference then is it that's a demand generator right that's mean more people's gonna come for example when I was in Las Vegas uh, there was a many conferences whole town including like surrounding areas like 10 15 20 miles around the Las Vegas used to be sold out those are demand generator because that's generate demand there is also demand drain that circumstances that produces a significant decrease in business right so I mean it could be even like weather weather one bad or something like that but overall the, the there are more uh, factors affecting future demands the hotels location in overall economy national state or lack local uh, uh, level uh, properties addition or elimination of specific services might affect the future demand the opening or closing of competitive hotels uh, opening of competitive hotels it could be both demand demand generator or demand drain because it could be demand generator because if the hotels opens in places we know sometimes more people decides to come to that area and it could help you or it could be demand rain because it could also uh, get some people from your hotel right um, predictable factors uh, uh, for example um, um, planned road construction right there are some things you can you you know ahead of time like seasonality I mean if you're in the uh, beach area that uh, the summer vacation area and the winter is coming is you know demands gonna go down you know that um, there is also unpredictable features like uh, unpredictable factors I'm sorry such as unplanned events right uh, it could be planned road construction but there is a something happened there was a like a, a some uh, problems associated with the road construction or it even in basic example is going to be severe uh, weather like you know in, in happens in, in in Orlando a lot in hurricane season in in, in etc uh, pricing decision made by the properties competitors right these are the things also affect your future demand if the they are lowering their prices a lot or increasing their price price a lot is going to affect your property's demand and uh, overall that pricing decision made by the your own property also affect the future demand if you lower your prices of course the demand is going to be higher or if you increase it's going to be uh, comparatively lower uh, we, if you if you recall we uh, talk about some of these calculations um, overall idea here is first uh, to be able to do a good forecasting for the future you need to know about special citywide or area-wide events in the area that affect demand like convention and visitor bureau and etc like you have to make uh, you have to uh, in communicate many uh, uh, both uh, profit and for-profit and non-profit organizations to follow up what kind of events coming into your uh, location second you need to understand demand for competitive hotel properties in the area as well you know you have a comp set you need to understand their demand it directly affects you 
you need the understand the supply side. When we say supply side, you need to consider the opening or closing of compact hotels. You need to understand also unusual demand. Like you need to adjust demand forecasting quickly when faced with significant significant demand altering events, like unusual events, inclement weather, power outage, power outage, airport or highway closings, etc. So these are the some of the examples that you need to consider for the uh, future demand or future data you need to consider. Now, what kind of forecast types we do in the lodging industry? These are some of just examples. I'm going to go very quickly, but from the occupancy for forecast, usually we, we like to forecast at least 1, 2, 7, 14, 21, and 30 days out. Like, what is the estimated forecasting, occupancy forecasting in like, let's say, 30 days? You want to you wanna know. If possible, you need to produce daily and weekly occupancy percentages estimates. And uh, unlikely they exceed 100%, but if, if you recall, I told you that sometimes it is uh, past 100%. Helps improve employee scheduling and show guests arrival and departure patterns when they come. It, it, it depends on the location. It could the, the guests could be coming or leaving in, in, in different uh, times. And you need to also do demand forecasting, right? You need to identify periods of hundred percent or more occupancy demand for rooms. Once again, this is extremely important to do. Uh, you, like I said, it is almost impossible to get uh, right always, but you should be at least as close as possible to uh, forecast the demand so you can determine all these things we are talking. So you need to be able to identify periods of very low demand. If you can, you should do forecasting 30, 60, 90 days out in the demand. What's, what's happening, like in, inclu incorporating all the things we talked about, including events and, and, and other factors. Um, we need to produce at least weekly occupancy percentages used to help establish room rate selling strategies. The reason we do the, for, the uh, revenue management, right? We Room rate selling strategies based in the, this uh, demand forecast. We also do revenue forecast. Why we do that? First, uh, we need to est we need we should be able to estimate rev par because of that. I, I mean, it says the forecast thirty days out or more because revenue is kind of like more a budget approach. And when you estimate some kind of uh, revenue forecasting, and if you est if you can estimate the revenue available revenue per available room more specifically gross operating profit per available room. Now you know that how much money you're going to get. So you can match your revenue forecast to pre-established budget. Does it make sense? It's going to be enough because in, in the starting of the year, you always estimate how many, how many people uh, employee going to, you are going to hire, how much uh, products you're going to order. We have some kind of budgets, but that revenue forecast needs to be uh, matched that uh, revenue forecast. Uh, and also, you need to get some kind of hotel cash flow analysis in, in revenue forecast. And that revenue forecast usually should not exceed revenue generated by more than 100% of available rooms. I mean, as, as you might guess, that uh, uh, you get the money where revenue forecast is going to be if you sell out all the rooms and usually uh, not exceed... 100% uh, except uh, in the event of like uh, overbooking and some other uh, possible uh, income opportunities. So these are the some of the forecast types, okay? Occupancy forecast, demand forecast, and revenue forecast. The book also talks about some misuse of forecasts. Now, why we do that? I mean, uh, forecasts, sometimes they do unrealistically low, sometimes they do unrealistically high. I'm not talking about uh, mistakes. Mistakes happens, right? We are talking about the intentional forecast. That's what the name implies, the misuse of forecast. Why we need, for example, why we want to do unrealistically low uh, forecast? If there is an incentive to exceed, beat the forecast, like, I don't. I, I want to give you just basic example. I don't want to get into too much detail. But let's say you are a general manager, and your owner says they give you 
financial reward for exceeding whatever the forecasted uh, 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 occupancy is. Let's say I'm just making up this. You got $100 uh, rev par uh, for the giving year. And you know that it's going to be a hundred dollar rev bar. But if you uh, tell the owner it's going to be about ninety dollar, then it's become hundred dollar. Now it seems you exceeded your forecasting, and it could be some financial benefits out of that. But what about the unrealistically high forecasts? Now, uh, let's say owner wants to sell a property. You might you might want to show that. Your property is doing well. I mean, like you know, it's, you have a, like hundred percent occupancy and people paying bunch of money. Like you exaggerate in a sense a little bit. These are not the right things to do, by the way. Of course, misuse of forecasts, right? And uh, or let's say general manager uh, talking to owner for a renovation. General manager wants to renovate the property, but uh, owner says, uh, you know what? Uh, we don't have a lot of money and maybe you exaggerate a little bit. Oh, we're going to have a lot of people coming. We, we should run away. Or you want to borrow from a bank, right? You want to show to a bank that you're, you're going to, you are making uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, money. These are not usually used for revenue management practices. Also, it could be motivational aspect of using the high uh, forecasting because you want to motivate the people that uh, you put some kind of target in the right For, forecast in the in, in the sense is a target that you sell the employees like uh, let's do this kind of approach but these things are not used from revenue management perspective but just to give you some example of the misuse of uh, forecasts now how demand forecasting affect or should affect the price allowing demand for hotel rooms to directly dictate their selling prices is the disaster to optimizing revenue. To optimize uh, ADR and rev bar in periods of temporarily high, heightened demand, revenue managers should seek to eliminate discounts rather than increase their rec, rec rates. So, which means if your forecasting shows very high demand, uh, you have to be careful uh, instead of increasing your uh, uh, rec rate. Uh, Usually there is an always there is a, some kind of discounts because rec rate is usually the highest price. Then you eliminate some of the discount. Uh, change in price also will result in a change in a customer willingness to buy. In periods of low demand, the the misconception is that lower rates generate incremental revenues. When that misconception is followed, the result is that. ADRs will fall rapidly in time of reduced occupancy levels. In periods of high demand, where the demand exceeds the supply of rooms, increasing the price of room will decrease number of buyers, but will uh, still, in most cases, result in the sales of all available rooms. These are the, some of the uh, uh, examples. Like if you are going to, if the, if the revenue man, ma, manager's uh, pricing strategy is the reduction average rate, uh, usually is the effect on uh, uh, demand for rooms is negligible uh, uh, because uh, this is already rate, I mean low uh, the demand times, right? Because, because of that, uh, effect on increasing the number of new buyers is not going to really work. So effect on ADR is going to be lowered. And effect on rev bar and total revenue is generally lower because you have a, a less uh, rate, lower rate. And uh, one other uh, strategy, but these are just some examples. Let's not forget that. Uh, uh, you did this, some kind of forecasting and you are in, uh, doing this kind of strategies to see what kind of results going to bring, right? So the second is the increase in average rate in response to high demand. Now, there is a high demand forecasting and you want to increase the average rate. Usually, it reduces number of potential buyers choosing the property. Of course, ADR is going to be increased. Generally increased because demand exceeds supply. These are, once again, it depends on the level, we are, but we are talking about the high demand. So, rep is going to be increased as well. And last one is the increase in average rate in times of average or low demand. Now, uh, th this is not a uh, good idea, right? Because uh, 
if there is a the average demand or low demand, if you increase the rate, it's going to reduce the number of potential buyers to come into your property. ADR is going to be increased because you are increasing the uh, uh, rate, but RevPAR is going to be lowered because supply exceeds demand. Once again, uh, just to give you an example here, ADR increase doesn't mean you are doing well. You need to look at the RevPAR and more specifically in GovPAR as well. And um, impacts of demand forecast on uh, revenue ma management strategy, we talked about this. So understand the unique property features that affect demand for their hotels. You need to know about spe special events that affect room demand. And you need to understand the demand for competitive hotels. Once again, we are repeating the things we talked earlier. You need to consider the pricing strategies of competitive hotels. You need to include in your forecasting weather, if you can. Road construction, these are well known, ahead of time known, hopefully. Season of the year, special occurrences, like, you know, it happens always, like there is a certain music festival that happens every year. Any other relevant factors when making demand assessment. In addition, we need to adjust forecast quickly when confronted with significant demand affecting events like an unexpected event. So keep the interest and reaction of guests foremost in all decisions related to room pricing. So if you, if, if you cannot uh, uh, understand the guests reaction to your prices, you are, you are uh, you're going to lose uh, uh, people. So this is the overall aspect of this chapter. Now, uh, we talked about uh, like historical data, current data, uh, expected future data, and some of the forecasting types. But what kind of forecasting methods are there? This is not really a part of chapter, but I wanted to give it to you if you are interested in. Uh, you might want to uh, listen this part. Uh, overall, uh, by the way, these are limited information, not every method or every uh, aspect of forecasting here, but overall we divide into two categories. Uh, first one is called the qualitative methods. Qualitative methods are mostly used to predict change in trends uh, based on uh, uh, experts or the people's assessment. And usually it's less developed than quantitative methods, but used by still by many organizations. The first major method is called Delphi. Delphi, the method, is a forecasting method based on the result of questionnaires sent to a panel of experts. So several rounds of questionnaires are sent out, and uh, when they, they receive the, like, they send the first uh, round, they receive the responses, they aggregate them, and share them with the group after each round. Uh, in this, because the reason it's been done, if you are an expert, you might have some opinion, but after see the other people's opinion, uh, you, you might say, oh, I didn't think about that, etc. So the experts are allowed to adjust their answers in the, the uh, subsequent round. Since multiple rounds of questions are asked and the panel is told that what the group is thinking as a whole, uh, uh, Delphi method seeks to, seeks to uh, uh, reach the correct response through consensus. Uh, and uh, the next one is the uh, what we call the market research. Market research is the survey of the peel, people to understand their need. This is very important. Sometimes we have a lot of uh, opinion about the, what people think, but people actually might be thinking uh, differently than what you think. So that is why you have to understand your market. You have to understand the people. Uh, panel consensus is the... Uh, uh, Similar to Delphi method, but could be any, uh, any, any, any kind of people. It's called panel consensus, like uh, the focus groups. So to select uh, that for certain characteristics or experience, and you get the information on whatever uh, you need. Uh, the next method, uh, next category is the quantitative methods, of course. That's what we usually use. And the first one is called the naive method. Naive method is, as the name implies, is a very naive approach. But basically, you are saying that tomorrow is going to be the same as today, or you are saying, like for example, uh, 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 tomorrow is Monday. What is the Monday's forecasting for the occupancy? You say it's going to be similar to one week ago Monday's occupancy. So you are basically just going. Uh, without major calculations, what happens in the past is going to 
represent exactly the same in the future. Uh, the next method is the moving average. Let me move here. And in this case, moving average, also called rolling average, you're going to use some of the calculations in, 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 in the chapter. Like, I, I, I put an example here. If you look at it, this is a three-day moving average. For example, in the first one, uh, first three days already happened, like it's already there. So 225, 224, 194 people, the actual cast customers, and you need to calculate the fourth one. And if you look at here, and uh, you, you will see that, uh, assume that this is not calculated yet, this is our actual values, but it's not happened yet, you calculate the here, fourth one. How you calculate that? You add the first three, 225, 224, and 194, and divide by three, you got the 214, okay? Now, but if you look at it, actual value was 168, so actually you made a, a kind of mistake in there. And, and uh, but the idea is same, okay? So next time you're gonna calculate the again, what you do is you, don't use the first one you use. You get now is 224, 194, 168, and you calculate it divided by three is going to be giving you 195. You eliminate the oldest one and add the new one always. Uh, you shouldn't worry about the mean error, absolute error, or mean squared error. This is the uh, error calculation methods, but it's, it's not part of this uh, chapter. And also, uh, if you look at the forecasting graph, you will see that uh some of them is close but some of them has actually made huge mistakes especially like look at that eight how much is the gap is there uh because moving average is consider each day is the same and they also created the what we call the exponential uh, exponential smoothing so this is a statistical technique for uh detecting significant changes in data by ignoring the fluctuations irrelevant to purpose at hand. Uh, one of the methods of, uh, that is also different uh, exponential smoothing approach, uh, older data is giving progressively less relative weight and importance, whereas newer data is giving progressively greater weights in, 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 in this example. Uh, Box Jenkins is a mathematical model designed to forecast data within the time series. Uh, what you do is uh, time you take the difference between data points and you make them stationary. And uh, because of this calculations allows the uh, model to pick out trends, typically using autoregression, moving averages, and seasonal difference in the, in, in, in the calculations. Like I said, you don't really uh, ha have to worry about that, but if you're interested in, in, in you might use maybe in the future. X13 ARIMA is the X13 autoregressive integrated moving average is the actually government uh, data, government forecasting program. It's been developed by the Census Bureau and, and almost majority of the government forecasting has been uh, is, is employed uh, a lot. And last category, in a sense, as a part of the quantitative method, is called causal methods. These are the estimating techniques based on that variable to be forecasted, which is like, for example, dependent variable has cause and effect relationship with one or more other or independent variables. If you remember from your statistics course, let's say our dependent variable is uh, uh, estimating uh, uh, occupancy demand for a certain date. And you, which is the dependent variable, you say that occupancy is depend on, then you have multiple independent variables and you calculate, you also say certain independent variables has more uh, effect on occupancy than others, then you can calculate all those. And in the future, you can check those independent variables and more important uh, uh, in independent variable changes uh, 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 gonna more affect your dependent variable. So that is all for this chapter. Thank you for watching.